gentlemen. Good day and welcome to Marico Limited Q1 FY24 earnings conference call. We have with us the senior management of Marico represented by Mr. Sogata Gupta, MD and CEO and Mr. Pavan Agrawal, CFO. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. Before we get started, I would like to remind you that the Q&A session is only for institutional investors and analysts. And therefore, if there is anybody else who is not an institutional investor or analyst, but would like to ask question, please directly reach out to Marico's Investor Relations team. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Saugata Gupta for his opening comments. Thank you and over to you, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening to all those of you who have joined the call. Uh, let me start by giving a flavor of the operating environment during the quarter that has gone by, after which I shall touch upon our performance, followed by our strategy and outlook for the year ahead. Uh, volume growth for the FMCG sector was in positive territory for the second consecutive quarter, led by steady growth in urban. However, evident green shoots in rural were not yet visible. Factors such as retail inflation dropping to sub-5% levels, late peak up in monsoons, uh, hike in tariffs, crop MSPs and higher government spending continue to give hopes of a gradual recovery in rural sentiment. Although the extent of the impact of spatial distribution of rainfall and Erratic uh, weather patterns on rural farm incomes also have a bearing on sentiment in the near term. But so far, I think at least in the south and west of the country, the monsoon looks good. While companies are taking price cuts in reaction to moderating commodity inflation, pricing growth has been tapering off sequentially. And therefore, growth in the coming quarters is likely to be led by volumes. Food continues to lead the sector, while mass personal care categories continue to exhibit a strong linkage to rural growth. Moving on to our performance during the quarter, domestic volume grew 3%, which is lower than our expectations. However, it should be read in the context of a couple of one-off pertaining to channel inventory adjustments. Firstly, a sharp month-on-month -month fall in vegetable oil prices has led to trade significantly lowering inventory levels in Sephora edible oil, while we have taken multiple price cuts amounting to 30% year-on-year -year to pass on the benefits to consumers. As a result, so polar edible oils recovered partially on the low base of last year. Since offtakes have remained healthy and the worst of volatility is most likely over now, we expect growth in Sopola oil to be steady going ahead. Secondly, the final phase of trade scheme rationalization initiated in post Q1 FY22 to smoothen the skew that was historically prevailing in the first quarter revenues of the core domestic business. Now that we have evened out the trade schemes throughout the year, we believe this will hold us in good stead over the long term in terms of managing supply chain and below the line spends more effectively. While volume growth in core categories of coconut oil and value oil, value added hair oils were subdued in Q1 by this one off impact and muted rural sentiment, we expect an uptick in both portfolios from Q2. Now that one offs are out of the way, we expect volume growth to resume an improving trajectory from Q2 as indicated by healthy offtakes in Q1, and 85% of our portfolio either gaining or sustaining market share and penetration on a mat basis. Therefore, we do not expect any impact on the growth aspirations for the full year as envisaged at the start of this fiscal and conveyed in the previous earnings call. Coming to a newer category, we have made a positive start in the course of achieving our diversification target for the year with food and premium personal care portfolios cumulatively contributing 20% of the domestic revenue. In food, the scale-up continued with growth in mid-20s. Growth in the core road franchise has been supplemented by healthy fraction newer categories of honey, plant-based protein, breads, and munchies. Consistent with the strategic approach of expanding our addressable market in value-added foods and nutrition segment, we are excited by the addition of the clean plant-based nutrition brand Flix in our portfolio. Flix is committed to the mission of making nutrition fun, and fueling the habit of incorporating clean, plant-based superfoods as a part of the healthy and active lifestyle. Flix's portfolio consists of products which are non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, cruelty-free, and uses reusable and recyclable packaging. The brand has built an impressive franchise by upholding evolving consumer needs and sound business fundamentals, 
and is now clocking an average run rate of 150 crore plus with a very low cash burn. It is evident that we are becoming a strategic investor of choice for founders who believe in growing sustainably with a watchful eye on profitability. Alongside the food portfolio, the composite premium personal care portfolio comprising Levon Serum, Setwet, Male Grooming and Digital First Brand has delivered a steady performance as well. We expect this portfolio to contribute to 10% of domestic revenues in FY24. As specific food and digital franchises attain scale, we are also charting a path towards making significant improvements in profitability and significantly reducing cash burn rates in our digital business. Moving we'll on to international business, which has been remarkably resilient despite varying degrees of uncertainty in the operating environment. Bangladesh extended its steady run with co portfolios performing healthily and more portfolios scaling up well. Vietnam faced some consumption headwinds, however, the underlying business remains strong. Mina, South Africa, and NCD business have been quite consistent over the last couple of years. We will continue to invest for growth in these businesses. The overall business is poised to deliver double digit constant currency growth in FI24. For the consolidated business, revenue growth in Q1 was significantly weakened by pricing intervention in core domestic portfolio and currency headwinds in a few overseas geographies. We believe pricing deflation in the domestic portfolio has bottomed out and will now start tapering off. Therefore, we expect revenue growth to move into positive territory in the second half of the year. Now, on the profitability front, gross margin and operating margin in Q1 expanded ahead of internal expectations, going to incrementally softer input costs while we maintain investment towards strategic brand building of core and new businesses. While we continue to invest in ANP and maintain our share of wise ahead of share of market, we expect operating margins to expand to 20% levels in FY24, uh, higher than envisaged earlier. To sum up, despite a slower than expected start, we are confident of delivering improving trajectory in top line and earnings growth through the course of this year. Last but not the least, we have always viewed the entire business operations through the lens of sustainability and our sustainability 2.0 framework has been seeing encouraging progress towards across each of the eight broad teams. We have detailed the same in our FY23 integrated annual report, which is released on our website two weeks ago, and hope it will make for a good reading. We firmly believe in creating shared value for all, will aid us in driving sustainable all around and superior growth in the long term. With that, I will close my comments. Thank you for your patient listening and I'll be most happy to take all your questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Abneesh Roy from Novama Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my first question is on yesterday's uh, acquisition. Uh, so in terms of uh, the business clicks, uh, what is the right to win? I see a very sharp uh, scale up uh, from 40 crores in FI22 to broadly 106 crores in FI23 and now uh, ARR of 1.5 billion. So it's a sharp scale up. So uh, in this kind of a format, uh, there are a lot of other players. Uh, if you could also talk about the distribution, how much is physical, how much is uh, online, and is there any uh, kind of synergy benefits you see from your other digital business or say uh, other acquisitions you have done in the last uh, six seven years? Okay, so I think Plix is, uh, first of all, Plix is largely online. And therefore, obviously, uh, one of the things that they expand, and we firmly believe that any digital brand needs to get a critical mass in the, you know, in the e-com and their own D2C space of hitting at least 80 to 100 crores, a certain level of set of consumers and level of saliency awareness before it goes into omni-channel. I think while uh, the current run rate of 150 is very encouraging and I think it is right for going to omni-channel, I think there is tremendous potential to max out there. If I believe, uh, I think there are three things why we believe clicks is a right to win. And if you really look at uh, one of the things we look at when we are doing 
acquisition in the digital business is obviously uh, ma brands which are sharply differentiated uh, for example if you know beardo beardo is a harley davidson of nail grooming and even after 3 years post our taking over i think the brand continues to perform well we look for founders who have a significant urge to build to last as opposed to just building to sell and therefore we look at also commercial savviness of the founders we look at good unit economics because if the unit economics is not good for any digital brand will never make profit whatever you scale up in and so the fundamental things like whether you have a core set of skus which are you know what is the repeat rate so we have now a set of what you call a digital quotient uh, what we do to evaluate brands and i think our success rate a hit rate in meeting acquisition assumption is pretty high now coming to synergies yes i think the one good synergy potential could be distribution the second as we now have a boutique of you know four five digital brands uh, there are a lot of opportunities for cross synergies at the back end which the process we have just about started so in a nutshell i think uh, quality of promoters quality of the brand equity uh, how consumers love them for example if you look at the ratings in some of the things like amazon and flipkart of a brand uh, whether there is significant repeat rates does the brand started making money to give you an example in both say mail grooming or you know plix compared to some other brands the burn rate is much lower and therefore uh, i think these are the kind of things we look at and we are pretty confident i think beardo is a perfect example i see plix as a huge mirror to what beardo has done you know and uh, and if you look at it uh, even in a so called slightly tougher circumstances for e-commerce or digital brands this brand continues to grow in fact it ended at 104 it's a hit i mean a current run rate of 150 and the quality of the business is good it's you know it's not about short term tactical sales okay Uh, one follow up there so the scale up has been good and i don't think the number of years of this business has also been very long so wanted to understand uh, in terms of r&d or patent or uh, those kind of right to win could you talk about that because uh, this is this is a very exciting field but i am sure a lot of other people are also are uh, trying uh, similar kind of stuff so what is uh, the reason for the scale up and is there a r&d angle to that obviously the product delivers i think we uh, while i not going to elaborate i think any acquisition we do we do a complete due diligence look at strengths and as i said that ultimately in any business whether it's digital brick and mortar the first thing you have you need a product that delivers you need a pricing and i'm talking of classical marketing that is value seeking you need a certain ability to innovate uh, consumer understanding i think they know how to operate the marketing funnel so i i am uh, i think and as i said it's not only about uh, the efficacy of product it's also about looking at the future pipeline the ability to develop these products and i think uh, also we look at the background of the founders in terms of their you know their perspective on technology product development and the fact that we are pretty excited by the kind of i have said that uh, the team which is there and i think the question is that uh, in any category i think there would be people uh, i think nutritional wellness is an exciting category the question is can you create a scale and a profitable path to market which creates a moat and there is always one number one and one path follower in any category which uh, you know which who they survive over kind of a time right one last follow up on this question last few years you have done multiple d2c acquisition and you have given lot of freedom at the local level which is i think uh, obviously required given uh, extremely different kind of uh, business and uh, very different kind of scale also so wanted to understand on the earlier acquisition how much of the marico template has been uh, put in place in terms of systems and process or still uh, those things haven't been done because uh, still you want to give that uh, culture uh, that culture to remain intact so if we see one of the biggest things about marico which has been perhaps marico has been successful by punching above its weight and we believe that we want to be skilled insurgents and operate with owner mindset now coming to uh, and that is the empowerment which we give which is a part inherent part of marico culture which attracts a lot of you know founders to us because that has become a template for us becoming a strategic investor of choice where we partner them into achieving their dreams and aspirations and a scalable profitable growth model now there are four things which are non negotiable first obviously portfolio capital allocation 
your entire compliance quality and you know the way the manufacturing practices those things are obviously non negotiable we are trying in a process of now that we have uh, and we also do a lot of cross learning uh, i think what we have not yet done is you know use one p data or first party data across all the four and starting cross selling that is something which would lead to huge synergies but i think uh, there are also we have started the process of cost management because and as you know that we have created a kind of a nano facility in one of our plants to actually start insourcing which will also give possible potential margin benefits so i think the process has started it's a fine balance but uh, we don't want to completely uh, run it like the core because the right to win in a core and the right to win in a digital businesses are completely different having said that once they cross 100 150 and beardo has already started the process they are experimenting with you know omni channel and brick and mortar where they definitely having the medico help is a source of competitive advantage sure uh, that's useful my second and last question is on your 20% uh, foods and premium personal care uh, which has uh, doubled in uh, essentially 3 years uh, so here my question is uh, in terms of gross and ebitda margin of this part of the 20% how does it compare with gross and ebitda margin of the legacy india business and between the two if you could give us some color i'm not uh, asking for exact number uh, which one is better which one is uh, uh, still uh, work in progress I mean, premium personal care obviously is a high margin business. I think what we need to do is ensure that uh, obviously, you know, premium personal care needs high end, high AMP also. In the case of food, it's slightly lower margin, but low AMP. But we are cognizant of the fact that the fact that if these are that very soon, the blended margin of premium personal care and food should be equal to the gross margin of our remaining core portfolio, which is our legacy portfolio, and that process is being significantly. focus on so that this happens within the next 12 to 18 months and if i may just add a push uh, you know at a currently at a weighted average level gross margins are definitely better than the overall portfolio now to talk about operating margin currently many of these businesses will be investment based and therefore this may not be the right time so once some of the some of the businesses get a scale of 150 200 crores to start making money so as and when these businesses will cross the road scale that will be the right time to look at the operating margin But having said that, we are extremely focused in terms of driving the right gross margin for the portfolio, and weighted average gross margin portfolio of these businesses put together is definitely better than the existing portfolio. Sure, thanks. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinesh. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Parsi Panthaki from IIFL. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. So my first question is on uh, margin. So you mentioned that uh, this year uh, you will do about a 20% uh, kind of margin. If I look at your margins historically, this is uh, uh, probably the highest or close to the highest uh, margin that uh, you would be clocking as a company. So what I wanted to ask is, on a medium term basis, on a two to four year kind of a basis. do you see your margin stabilizing at this 20% or do you still see uh, over that time horizon uh, sort of uh, expansion uh, in the overall company level margin at a consolidated level so i think there are two things one is as i said you are absolutely like we we are pretty confident that we should be able to cross the 20% mark in margins this year now uh, unless there is significantly black swan inflation that hits in you know simultaneously on copra crude and everything in one particular year i think it will start improving because there are two parts to it one i think in food for example as we scale up will be significantly starting the margin improvement program on food because food is we are very very mindful that while we grow food we shouldn't you know get our eyes off the margin story the second thing we are looking at is also i think we have not done well in the premiumization to be very honest and the premiumization we are finally getting our act right and therefore we are going to uh, you know improve this one number 3 i think if you look at some part of international business obviously bangladesh is doing well i think secondly uh, vietnam also we have now replicated some of the bangladesh journey and we are now replicating middle east north africa middle east north africa we didn't have scale and therefore we didn't have margins but there are players who make 20% plus margin in fact some of the market leaders in that market make 30% margin so that's another potential reason so i would say margins is likely to creep up 
However, in a year where there is a black swan, where you have a 30-40 percent increase in copra and crude hits 100, there would be some this one. But on a long, medium term basis, I will see margin creeping up. The other thing which is there, this is particularly happened in the last few quarters, is that you know we haven't got the leverage, operating margin leverage because because of deflation, the revenue is down. Number two. Uh, I hope that by second half, the anniversarization of deflation of Bangladesh currency, which is leading to translation, uh, you know, hits in our both top line and my, you know, and your bottom line, that will also start, you know, somewhere neutralizing. Because as you know, the Bangladesh contributes to a significant portion of top line and bottom line in our mix, and that had a significant depreciation uh, starting from Q1, but now it's settling down. So by Q3, that effect will start uh, neutralizing. So overall, I think subject to no black swan, uh, to answer your question, yes, uh, it will not, there will be a steady increase, but not a, you don't expect any hockey stick from here. Yeah, sure. Just a sub question on that. While you are uh, going to make attempts to improve the food margins, uh, I'm sure for the foreseeable future, they will at the EBITDA level be below the company average. So therefore, and this is a faster growing segment, so even if the margin improves hypothetically, let's say from a 3% to a 10%, but a 10% on a significantly higher base because it's a faster growing business, that doesn't that put a drag on your overall company margins? No, no. So that's why I talked about the PPC or the premium personal care, which is serums plus male grooming plus skin care and digital. Now they have the potential for higher EBITDA. And number two in foods, at least in oats, we have proven that we can deliver a kind of a, a core margin in EBITDA, EBITDA terms in oats. Because see the food, the, I think the ask is to how do I start hitting 150, 200 for each category. So the focus from now on in food, instead of launching 10 things, whatever we have, and maybe we'll launch one or two things, is that how do I uh, start doing two things? One is getting, focusing on skill. For example, soya, honey, munchies, can we get scale? Because food, the margin really goes with scale. The second thing which we have started, which we have not done, is, you know, right now you have individual set of advertising, you know, whether Safola oil advertisers, Safola uh, oats advertisers, Safola munchies advertisers, Safola honey advertisers, very soon. In fact, you know, over the next couple of weeks, you will notice the first signs of a what I call a Safola master brand advertising, which will also give you efficiencies in AMP rather than the fragmented AMP which you are currently seeing in foods. Right. My second question is on Waho. So when our fourth quarter results uh, came out, uh, you were very confident that uh, this business is now on track for, if not a double digit, at least a high single digit kind of a growth. Uh, this quarter Waho is roughly flat. So, just wanted to understand, uh, uh, apart from uh, the pipeline uh, issues that you mentioned, I mean, does that explain that entire differential between a zero and a high single digit, or is there some other reason for this? There are two things, I think. Yes, uh, not pipeline. Pipeline has contributed some part of it. I think the second part, what has happened is that uh, we continue to see uh, at the bottom of pyramid high intensity, this one, because everyone thinks this... Uh, one interesting phenomenon of observing, obviously, while the food inflation is slightly softening and overall inflation is softening, the tendency towards focus on consumers buying LUPs and price point packs and therefore competitive intensity at bottom of pyramid, which uh, has again subtly increased. Okay. Having said that, again, I believe that quarter two onwards, you will see uh, reasonable improvement as far as the VAO numbers is concerned, in the second half, we'll go back to what we had talked about. Right. Just wondering here, I mean, just thinking aloud, historically, we haven't seen consumer trends being so fickle that they change in one quarter and then suddenly revert back in the second quarter. So, uh, uh, what gives you confidence that whatever weakness you're seeing now will sort of uh, reverse very soon? I think it's not the weakness on the sentiment. I don't think if you look at the category growth levels, I don't, in fact, it has improved. So if you ask me that is Q4 and uh, Q4 plus, if you add say Q4 plus Q1 and compare it 
say let's look at a jan june okay because mm. and then compare it with say july december of last year there is a sequential growth there is a loft take growth there is a market share gain and therefore if you look at a jan june together and vaco i think the story is better and therefore as and i don't think any consumer sentiment dip has happened drastically in off take terms run rate in uh, in terms of jan march versus april june there has been no significant difference okay okay understood uh, that's all from me thanks and all the best sabata thank you the next question is from the line of vivek m from jeffrey please go ahead hi vivek hi sabata hi pavan uh a couple of questions uh, uh can you sort of talk about the secondary words so we know the primary obviously can you just talk about you know because of this uh, channel issue and the the measures that you have taken on the scheme trade scheme rationalization what would be the secondary roughly speaking a couple of percent i don't want to get into specific and as i said that is not an excuse for why we have done three okay so i think it is a widely a couple of percentage points higher and that will be primarily uh, on in case of parachute and bahu and it's only in parachute and bahu that's right okay got it and yeah, tell you, i think so that you have the history the perspective that yes. if you look at you know historically long ago q1 was 31 we have got it down to 27 we want to take it down to 25 so that should explain the thing so that also means uh, you know uh, that also means because there is a destocking in this quarter Uh, so they should unwind and and then you know uh, the late as as you know uh, trade promotions uh, get streamlined automatically the revenues should also pick up in the next uh, let's say quarter. I think it is also a good opportunity. Ultimately, ultimately, it's off take. Number two, as I said, that uh, uh, we want to mirror off take, and you know so that off takes are smooth and off take along with smoothing of all. you know the secondary and primary so i don't want to get into primary secondary offtake but all i can assure you is that i think given whatever trend we see that this quarter onward it will start improving again but you know it's very difficult to get into that just because secondary was higher than primary last quarter i will want to do that much because see ultimately we have to look at something which ensures and ultimately that we look at offtake and penetration as long as that is and market share protection so uh, i think primary is just a derived thing so i don't want to get into you know looking at primary and secondary but all i can assure you is that the numbers that will come from both parachute and uh, will be some certainly uh, better than what it is there in q and the overall the volume will be keep on increasing as we go towards q2 q3 q4 got it and just a follow up so that you know so i know there are there Uh, and again these are dipstick surveys so may, may not be exactly accurate but my understanding is that you know marico uh, at least in the last few years that i have seen uh, you know your your uh, trade inventories are quite you know quite uh, at an optimum level all, all all you can always get better for sure but unlike some of the other companies who actually play with inventory a bit here and there in that context uh, uh, you know um, Uh, i would have imagined that you know there is no big you know uh, uh, opportunity to kind of streamline the the trade inventory correct me if that understanding is incorrect so i think uh, we obviously go into a, what i call a pool based system which we do for our management having said that you must be cognizant the one thing which is you know especially urban distributors when you have a lot of safola index they have a uh you know the especially in this quarter where there was a 30% reduction in prices obviously the revenue would have got impacted okay so that leads to and you know, so therefore we have to be mindful of our partners uh, profitability and other things got it uh the next question is on uh, both you know specifically on parachute and safola with you know with whatever decision that we have seen we are seeing how do you how do you see competition particularly from let's say regional loose in case of parachute and uh, you know and and somewhat similar to you know a bit organized in case of safola or edible oils so in the case of parachute what happened in q uh, q1 is obviously there was a little bit of deflation fortunately we believe that deflation is now settled in and there could be a sideways movement of copra into little more positive territory as we move into uh, 
August, September, October. Uh, so therefore, I think that issue that was there in terms of uh, slight, uh, this one on volume, that should be taken care of. The other thing which we are doing is, as I said, that uh, we want to uh, invest money to ensure that we, for demand generation, so we are aggressively investing money behind demand generation. So you, you will see that even in Q2, Q3, Q4, there will be end the increases while we uh, commit turnover, we deliver our margins of 20% plus. We will not deliver margins by having a, you know, cutting down YOI on ANP. Okay. So I think that is what we are doing, that we are putting uh, uh, things in place for demand generation and micro marketing in place so that uh, uh, parachute uh, this one in back on growth and whatever value we can give to the consumer will do value. Need not be pricing but other tactical means. Uh, coming to Sofola, see Sofola's issue is this, Sofola uh, offtakes are good. It was just that there has been a significant downstocking. We have to get into a position where there is a steady, uh, you know, what I call steadiness of, or less volatility in the pricing. Those people wait and watch and they don't stock. Now coming to offtakes and market share, I think the current pricing of Sofola, which is that, you know, the pricing model where the price premium, the price premium is more or less right now. I don't think there is that problem in Sapola. The problem is basically what we need is a slightly more steadier and less volatile raw material so that, you know, uh, so therefore it is not a competitive scenario. It's a more of a STR thing. And it, it always doesn't happen here because I'm just, you know, uh, just telling you that suppose I lose STR, I will again suddenly gain back STR. It normally doesn't happen until the volatility completely ceases and people see steady things. And it's unlikely to happen because, you know, there are too many macro factors in the world, global political scene that, you know, impact sometimes oil. But we believe at least the deflation thing which kept on happening from the peak, as you know, the 30%, that will now keep on slowing down as we enter the consecutive quarter. Okay, got it, got it. And last question, if I may, Swagata, on uh, gross margin. So, uh, there is a smart recovery in this quarter. Uh, you are still, you know, uh, at a at an overall level, you are still below, let's say, historic peaks. Where do you think, you know, the rest of the year on gross margin? So, do we see a stability in gross margins, or there is still, you know, there is still leg up over here uh, on this uh, line? So this quarter we have expanded the gross margins about 450 basis points, 450 to 500 basis points. Now, going ahead, uh, you know. Margins will not be as high as uh, this one, but we still believe that at a full year level, it will be in the range of 300 to 400 basis points. And of course, um, a lot, part of it will also get plowed back into investment behind brand building. And therefore, at an operating margin level, what we are saying is that minimum will deliver 20% plus. Right. And, but, you know, Pawan, uh, just a follow-up, you know, this quarter is 23% plus uh, on EBITDA margin. So, even if I were to take the, the same flattish number and, and the revenue line is now more streamlined, does that mean, you know, what essentially you are saying is that AMP spends can actually go up quite a bit? Because, you know, the, there is a there is a step up in uh, in staff costs in this quarter. So even if I assume the same run rate, I mean, at least in my model, at least I get a number which is more closer to 21% on EBITDA margins and not, at least, and not uh, 20. We also have to appreciate that, you know, uh, margin of 23.2% is also because of the denominator effect, right? Because the revenues have not grown. It has in fact grown by 3%. And as we move ahead in quarter two, we expect that it should move to largely flattish trajectory and from H2 onwards, it should move into positive trajectory. So that denominator effect will go away, number one. Number two also, as I said, in overall gross margin, we still expect that 300 to 400 basis points will be there. And yes, you're right. Uh, a large part of that expansion, as I said, uh, the ANP expenditure could be high in uh, double digits and therefore operating margin we are saying 20% plus. So 20% plus is the bare minimum that we are saying. There is also a possibility that we might deliver slightly more than that. Okay, got it. Crystal clear. Wish you all the very best, team. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hasno, <coughs> SUD Live. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so my question on margin has been answered. Uh, I have second question on your foods and premium personal care portfolio. So that has uh, 
come to now almost 20% sort of of uh, your domestic revenue so if i take let's say three years sort of a view what's our internal target uh, for this uh, as a percentage of overall uh, domestic revenue here so i think we don't have any further target i think we should ensure that obviously this part of the portfolio will be a growth portfolio having said that what we are saying is that two things we are looking at in this portfolio how do you grow profitably so food's gross margin needs to increase and we will also focus on the digital brands uh, you know in fact compared to as i already said that if you look at plix as some other similar brand in that space you look at geodo versus some similar brand in this space are burn rates are far lower but at the end of the day how do you get them into profitability space very quickly so it's a combination of a and b and therefore i would not just grow i need to first get the profitability right and then grow understood understood thanks for that that's it from my thank you thank you the next question is from the line of latika chopra from jp morgan please go ahead Uh, hi, uh, Sankata and Pavan. Uh, my first question, uh, you know, is on pricing. Uh, clearly, on Safola edible oils, you know, there is a fair bit of volatility, and we recently saw, you know, firming up of, uh, you know, palm oil prices. Uh, do you see, uh, you know, uh, uh, that pricing for Safola needs to be taken up of this uh, firm to sustain, uh, and how soon that can happen? And what are what is the implication on uh, you know revenue growth in the second half? You know, I heard Pawan saying that you know things could be flattish, but as we move into second half, uh, does price inflation completely goes away? In your assessment? No, so Latin is very difficult to you know. There has been very mild increase you know in our set of you know edible oils which we use in the last couple of uh, last week actually. Now. it's very difficult to say all i can say is that this quarter we are at 30% deflation the deflation numbers will keep on decreasing in the second half that there will be no deflation we might as we exit the might move into smart like slight inflation and therefore revenue growth will be volume growth or volume growth plus we are also indicating that the volume growth will when we started with a 3 it will be more as we move into the uh, you know quarter 2 and second half but it is very difficult to right now say them that what will happen whether the uh, whole up inflation will happen and right now we are almost this is modeled on this is uh, on the current pricing of the fola say okay so with current pricing of the fola you feel the overall or uh, revenue growth or uh, we should turn positive in second half will uh, probably have flattish to marginal positive pricing is that Yeah, that's right. That's that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. The second, it was on you know your just comments on gross margins. The uh, you know I heard Pawan mention three hundred to four hundred basis point expansion for full year. I think in the decade of two fifty to three uh, hundred. And I think the question was saying you know you had a five hundred basis point expansion in Q one, and for full year you are talking about you know two fifty to three hundred basis points. So should we now take it as more like three hundred to four hundred? And is it on account of uh, you know? uh the denominator catching up uh, and probably some bit of mix effect as inflation comes back so that a full year you can consider that number about 300 to 350 basis point and not really for the rest of the rest of the year so at a full year you can consider 300 to 350 basis point okay and more importantly as i said mm-hmm. yeah sorry go ahead no no continue sorry go ahead more importantly i mean there are multiple levers which will keep on playing out during the right there are forecast it's very difficult to have a right forecast even the rest of the international agencies have not been able to get the right forecast for the edible oil so there are a lot of multiple things that will play out but what we believe is that the 300 to 400 basis points somewhere between 300 to 400 basis points could be the gross margin expansion and if we get that expansion we will continue to invest because we have a lot of new agenda that we have created and we would definitely want to fund them however what is more important is that an operating margin level is 20% plus okay and and the last question you know was on uh, you know the modern trade uh, contribution uh, for uh, waho and uh, parachute if you could share that any any rough sense there and uh, are you seeing the salience of private labels in modern trade channel increasing in in the coconut oil space any any comments here so i think we will not uh, share uh, we will not be able to share channel wise contribution for brands 
But all I can say is that if you ask me whether the market share of parachute is lower in modern trade, the answer is no. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Sagat and Pavan. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Adam Mitra from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, Adam. Hi, good evening. Hi, hi good evening, Sagat and Pavan. Uh, my first question was actually on the acquisition again. Uh, so, you know, the difference I see with your past acquisitions is in the recent past is that this seems to already be at a reasonably larger scale of 150 crores ERR. Um, and in the kind of product segment they are in, which is plant-based protein and uh, things, uh, do you see this? Uh, I mean, uh, at what growth rate can this grow at from a base that is already 150? Because it seems a pretty large actually number for these kind of brands to achieve. Uh, and does it mean that being plant-based, it's going to be a bit of a niche within the protein and nutraceutical market? Or it's not necessary that these products will be a niche and the pricing could be competitive even though it's uh, plant-based positioning? So the way we see it is that if you look at India, I think uh, India, even plant protein is going to be a big driver of growth. And as, as opposed to the entry point in the Western markets where it has started off a lot of plant protein has started off with mock meat and other things. Here it is a plant protein nutraceutical or plant protein in the face of soya which we are doing in food. Now coming to uh, any nutraceutical if you have, there are four or five drivers of growth. So there is heart health, there is what is called weight management, there is uh, diabetes or sugar management, there is gut health and bone health. So these are the five platforms when a wellness or a nutraceutical brand works. So what we look at is that whether plant protein and some of the brands, and incidentally, interestingly, Lix also has something called, you know, it's a little bit of personal care skin food in that territory. So what we looked at is that in all these platforms, and that is how global nutraceutical brands operate, you know, that can my proposition ultimately extend across all five? And we believe that it happens. And at the end of the day, you know, there are some famous, you know, big startup brand starts with something, you can always move to adjacencies, isn't it? Sure, sure. Uh, no, understand like beard, beard oil is still 40%, but it's okay. I mean, at the end of the day, we can move to adjacencies. You start with something and then it stands for, for example, it stands for nutrition with fun, cool nutrition. That's what the brand stands for and maybe it can be extended. No, understood, understood. And a uh, related question was, I mean, uh, again, not asking exact numbers, but uh, approximately if you could share the, uh, you know, range of gross margins that this category or this brand has, uh, and is the is, is the 150 crore turnover uh, fragmented across a large number of SQs, or you see certain SQs becoming uh, sizable uh, within this 150 crore turnover that they currently have? So I alluded to this. One of the things we look at for any good acquisition or a good, uh, which is a scalable is, do you have a couple of hero SKUs with high repeat rate, a loyal set of consumers with a very high, you know, Amazon rating, which are the core of the brand? Because they are the guys which give you that, what I call the foundation of growth. A lot of startup brands launch 50 things and start to show growth. I think this one doesn't have that. There are a couple of SKUs which contribute a significant portion of the uh, this one story. The so gross margin is high. I can also tell you that uh, not many food categories can have a digital model because digital model unit economics requires a certain set of ACOS. This brand can afford to have a digital model which is profitable with a, because of the gross margin is high. In fact, if you look at food, very few food categories can have a standalone digital model because food usually have lower gross margin. Understood. Thanks for that. And um, my uh, second question was, you, you've given this uh, 400 crore turnover, which is a combination of <clears throat> some of your older brands like Levon and Petlet and uh, the new age digital brands. Uh, now, my understanding is that the, the older brands which came from the Paris portfolio, they were probably not growing very well leading into COVID in the previous four or five years, uh, while the digital brands, of course, grew very fast uh, in, that, in the post-COVID period. So how do you look at the growth of this overall 400 crore portfolio, uh, especially in the environment that this year, this year, that internet e-commerce growth is slowing down uh, in personal care? Uh, and how do you think of the legacy? I mean, the older brands like Levon and Petrit also contributing uh, from here on. So the 
way we look at it, I don't want to get into individual this one, but the fact is that the newer part of the portfolio, which is premium personal care, food, digital brands, we would like it to grow by 15 to 20 percent every year from a medium term basis. And just one clarification, and uh, this 400 crores does not include the Bharat portfolio. It is basically the digital brands of uh, Beardo plus Just uh, House plus our own in-house digital brands. Oh, okay. So you you saying it does not include Levon and uh, Sequet, which I think yeah. you mentioned in the yeah. yes. Okay. However, when we are saying that our contribution from the premium personal care and food that will become twenty percent by end of year twenty four, that definitely includes the Levon uh, the Paras uh, portfolio as well. Okay, understood, understood. Uh, thanks. That's it from my side. All the best. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Sheila Rati from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just had one. Hi, I just had one question, and this is more on the medium term. I would say, uh, you know, so the question is uh, from your lens, uh, what is the current positioning of the Sapola brand uh, in the minds of the consumer? And I'll uh, I tell you why I ask this question is basically, you know, company has embarked on this diversif diversification strategy uh, in the last few years. Uh, so, is there a thought here that you know over a period of time we could be you know thinking about uh, you know reducing our exposure to edible oil uh, because you know it kind of adds to the volatility volatility in the business. So, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. You're absolutely correct. I think uh, my dream is that another three four years from now food becomes higher than edible oil in the portfolio. Okay, because that way. We will de-risk this commodity and one of the things we internally track is how much we over the next five years will continue to do a commodity de-risking which we will do on our portfolio because at the end of the day ultimately sadly enough oil and water doesn't mix you know and in the personal care uh, it is far less volatile to your commodity and because we give our RM percentage as a percentage of net realization needs to continue to decrease and that is something we track over the next five years. Now coming to Sapola specifically. I think Sapola, if you look at the history of Sapola, it was completely anchored on heart health. It started off, you know, if you look at the 1994 advertising, it was uh, on fear. So it was for the sufferer. So it was curative. It went into preventive. And now I think Sapola is a way of healthy life. And ultimately food, it gives us taste values. And I think one of the things we are trying to do is that we are also trying to ensure that how does Sapola, uh, besides expanding the total addressable market, is that coming from a sufferer to somebody who wishes to, uh, what I call, adapt a healthy way of life, you know. It's like uh, taking anything which is better for you. So Sapola will enter categories with an option which is better for you. And that's how the brand will keep on growing. Having said that, obviously the core brand, which is the Sapola oil that Heart equity is too strong and we will not completely, obviously, vacating the heart equity. What we are saying is it is for a healthier heart and as opposed to somebody with already a heart problem. And yes, so we will continue to have this brand, but, you know, the endeavor would be to continuously increase the exposure towards other food businesses. Yeah, and therefore the brand becomes from denial to happiness from... You know, having far more food values, uh, moving from individual sufferer to family, I don't think it still will encompass kids, but I think that's the next step. But I think it is more of saying that uh, you eat what you want to eat, but eat healthily. And therefore, Sapola gives you options, you know, whether it's breakfast, which is snacking in between meals or a meal substitute. And just one more bit on this, and you know, I asked that question also, is that uh, how is it positioned in the minds of the consumer? So today when a consumer buys Sapola oats, uh, is this because, you know, uh, they know that Sapola edible oil is a, you know, healthy oil and that's why uh, they are, you know, they're buying the oats product also because it comes from the same brand. Is there that salience which is still there in the minds of the consumer? See, very interestingly, the amount of number of households who buy oats are higher than number of households who buy oil. As you know, because oats the is a price point at 17 rupees, okay? Now, I think obviously the primary driver for the consumer to buy Sapola continues to be health. It is no longer just heart health, it's health. And therefore, and the taste is the discovery. 
And therefore, if you look at the ragi chips, for example, and as uh, we are uh, investing in millet in a big way, and then you will see some of the things which we are doing on millet, and we believe that it is offering. Uh, so we are one of the learnings when we, you know, in 2010 or 11, we prototyped a snack and it bombed. And one of the learning is that Indian consumers will never at all compromise taste for health. And therefore, all the products which we design for Sakola, first we ensure that it beats on the, is parity on the taste benchmark. Health, anyway, is pre-sold as far as Sakola is concerned. So taste is actually a discovered and a surprise benefit which we want to drive. Understood. Very clear. Thank you, Swagatam. Thank you. A reminder to participants, please press star and 1 to ask a question. The next question is on the line of Shirish Pardeshi from Centrum Brooking. Please go ahead. Hi. Yeah, hi. hi, good evening, uh, Sogat and Pawan. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm on slide 7 uh, and I'm just uh, doing and reading the numbers uh, where you have given PCNO number, which is minus 2 volume minus 5 value and Vaho is uh, flat in terms of value. It is more curious, if I track the journey of last eight quarters, uh, about eight quarters before there was a down trading and Vaho was doing significantly well, um, you alluded that now uh, the Vaho is, uh, I mean the, the entry point Vaho uh, has seen a lot of competition. Uh, in terms of consumer behavior, uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, I mean, I'm not looking at the primary number, but on ground, if you tell me something about, is the consumer shift is primarily affected in the mass end of the product is because of food inflation, or there is something more to it, and that's why the even Baho is not showing. And related question on that, how the category has evolved or declined uh, in terms of value volume over last, uh, say, four, five quarters? Okay. So uh, let me just address it in two parts. So if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the last, and I'm talking, alluding to the last couple of quarters, five, six quarters. Sure. So what happened is whenever there is, uh, unlike some of the other personal care categories, in the case of value-added hair oil, it has, and it is somewhere mirrored some of the mass personal care categories where there is significant amount of rural consumption and agnostic consumption in terms of quantity across different LSM classes. So whenever there is inflation, so compared to a say premium skin care and other parts of the, you know, the personal care portfolio, VAHO or soaps or uh, say these are the, while you know, detergents obviously has a premium end of it, which is the liquid detergent and other, these kind of categories, they get impacted far more. So what we have seen actually, if you look at the start, there has been downgradation, in addition to that, what happened is that uh, there has been significant intensity into the bottom of pyramid. Now, even if the organized players, which are not participating intensively, I mean, in the sense that one change that happened, which we noticed from Q4, is some of the organized players in WAO started raising prices. The trade intensity, which is the below the line, actually, uh, you know, so the pricing got transferred into below the line spend. Secondly, some of the smaller players are also therefore aggressive. So what has essentially happened is the consumption, while it has grown in volume terms, the value, there has been a kind of a slight value degradation that has happened. Having said that, I think that's why I said that our task is to, and we are already seeing that in terms of the fact that in the last eight quarters, every quarter we have got value growth and we are now focusing on value market share. We have started getting value growth and we have to, as I said, do a, and we are doing it, but it's still there's a journey in terms of doing a better job in the premium part of the portfolio. Now, the premium part of the portfolio has now started just about growing. We believe in the last one or two months, we're seeing that growth. Okay. Uh, uh, second question on the related uh, PCNO. Have we dropped or taken any pricing action uh, in this quarter, quarter one, or and now you you are forced to take some action. No, I don't think so. Having said that, as I said, that we will, uh, you know, we saw a slight deflation that happened in Q1, but we didn't take pricing action. That is perhaps one of the reasons. But the reason we don't want to take pricing action, we expected the thing to reverse, which has reversed. Because we this taking frequent pricing action, you know, 
upset the rhythm of the sale which we so we actually weathered it out this quarter and we expect now things to be okay and our pricing to be okay because what we didn't want is take a pricing action as i told you last time in the call that given that pcno has strs and a very widely distributed it takes around 6 to 8 weeks for the pricing to realize and then we shouldn't have a thing that we are you know underpriced in the market and we have also we have lost out on the margin and we lost out on volume in the first quarter so i think we have taken that uh, comp, you know that kind of a stance where we wanted to wait because this frequent price up and price down actually is not good for the brand and good for our rhythm of sale thank you ladies and gentlemen we'll take the last question from the line of latika chopra from jp morgan please go ahead Uh, uh, hi. Uh, just uh, one one question. Uh, you know, on the overseas market, and you know they have expanded, expanded quite well. Uh, could you uh, advise? Latika, your voice is breaking. Please use the handset. Yeah. Hi. Is it better? Slightly better, but okay. Yeah. I am on my handset. Uh, my question was the overseas margins. Uh, you know, the margins are twenty nine percent plus this quarter. Uh, What drove this, and uh, do you think this will be sustainable? This is largely driven by uh, again copra gains in Bangladesh and going ahead uh, back to the levels of 25-26 percent. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That would be our last question for today. I now hand the conference back to the management for their closing remarks. Thank you, and over to you. To conclude, we had a slow start to FY24 on the top line front due to one-offs in the domestic business, but we draw confidence from underlying indicators of a pickup in domestic volume growth followed by tapering off in pricing deflation from here on. The international business has been resilient, and we expect to sustain its healthy growth momentum. Given the accommodative input cost environment, we will continue to aggressively invest to drive an improving trajectory of growth in the core and newer portfolio. That being said, we should be able to deliver healthy margins. on a year on year basis through the year to sum up the full year earnings growth prospect as envisaged at the start of the year remain firmly intact if you have any further queries please feel free to reach out to our ir team and they'll be happy to address thank you and have a great evening thank you very much ladies and gentlemen on behalf of malico limited that concludes this conference thank you all for joining us and you may now to connect your lines thank you Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share and comment.